Um, welcome you all to this month's meeting of our Environment Regeneration Committee. Um, first thing I'm going to do is ask Karen to read the notice and summons of meeting. Thank you, Chair. Um, to all members of Environment and Regeneration Committee, you're hereby summons to attend the monthly meeting of Environment and Regeneration to be held in the Council Chamber, Straban, Wednesday the 17th of April at 4pm. And I'll take the roll call. Alderman Derek Hussey. Aye. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Yeah. Alderman Julie Middleton. Record apologies, he's hoping to be here, but... Okay, no problem. Uh, Councillor Jason Barr. Here. Councillor Raymond Barr. Councillor John Boyle. Um, Councillor Caitlin Deeney. And Shaw. Councillor Alex Duffy. Councillor Brian Hart. And Shaw. Councillor Emma McGinley. And Shaw. Councillor Ray McKee. Councillor Patrick Murphy. Councillor Declan Norris. And Councillor Martin Riley. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for that, Karen. Um, members. Just read the broadcasting statement. Um, I would like to remind everyone present that this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of repeated viewing. This broadcast may be terminated or suspended in accordance with our protocol. If you're seated in the lower public seating media or media areas, it is possible that the recording cameras will, will capture your image, and this will result in the possibility that your image will become part of the broadcast. By entering the council chamber and using the press or lower public seating area, you are consenting to being filmed and consenting to the use and storage of those images for webcasting or training purposes and for the purpose of keeping historical records and making those records available to the public. If you wish to avoid this, you should move to the upper public gallery. But that doesn't apply here because we're in Stavang. <laughs> if you wish, uh, a copy of the Council Privacy Notice may be found on the Council website, www.derrystavan.com. So, members, that takes us then to item four, which is declarations of members' interests. Does any member wish to a declaration? If anyone pops up during the course of the meeting, you can declare it then. So, then that brings us to uh, item five, which is our first um, of two presentations today. Um, pleased to welcome Jonathan Gray, who's the Mabai project sponsor, uh, Richard Crow, director of resource and efficiency division, and Claire O'Neill, who's the Mabai project manager. And of course, the, the presentation is in regards to the Mabai remediation project, and it's from Dara. So I'm going to pass over now to your good selves. Thank you. So thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you for the introduction um, and thanks to members for the invitation for um, inviting us to, to come here today and provide the update. Um, the, we also thank you for the, the members for the approval to hold a workshop with members on the remediation options appraisal. Um, I know uh, it was a, a notice of motion, which was a, a lot of questions around that remediation options appraisal. Um, and it's a complex and quite detailed process, so we really welcome the opportunity to present that, which which happened last week. So, so thanks for that, which we'll we'll cover a wee bit more as we work through the presentation. Um, so the presentation today will will outline just where we are in the process, and then go into a wee bit more detail on that options appraisal process. Uh, and just before really I get into the, that presentation. Um, you'll all be aware that th there's still live criminal proceedings ongoing in relation to the Maboy site. Um, and our lawyers have asked that I read out the following. So if you, you bear with me to re read this out. So you're all aware the criminal proceedings in relation to the Maboy site remain active with the courts. Therefore, I advise our lawyers to read out that now that some of the defendants have pleaded guilty to Article 4 of the Waste and Contaminated Land Order 1997 offences, the court will move to consider sentencing and the associated proceeds of crime application. Some of the facts relevant to the sentencing remain in dispute. The prosecution therefore remains active per the Contempt of Court Act 1981 and NIA will not be able to be in a position to comment any further. Thank you. So next slide. So next slide, just an overview of what we're going to go through, which I think I've covered already, really an update, and then we'll, we're happy to take take any questions um, and, and discussion. 
So next slide is really setting the, the scene of what we're all here. We're all, we're all very aware of the Maboy site. Um, it's on the outskirts, on outskirts of Derry City, uh, 46 hectares, so uh, a, a very large site. And the estimated tonnage of 1.6 million tonnes of weight deposited on that site, which is the subject to the remediation um, options process and approved that we're working through. Uh, what is really important to note just on that uh, estimate on the 1.6 million tonnes of waste is that that is an estimate of the total waste on the site and it includes historic waste over a number of years and going back to as far as the second the 1960s um, so that the the current criminal proceedings um, is, is a lesser amount than that 1.6 million tonnes so it's really important to note that. Um, a really important thing is that we know that River Fawn runs adjacent to the site um, and we'll, downstream we have the drinking water abstraction point. Just on, on the slide there as well, we have obviously a picture of the River Fawn and then we have the ongoing um, picture there where we have the, the gates of the site. So we have the ongoing issues with security and keeping the site uh, secure from any um, unauthorised access. So the you'll be aware of that just from the, the monthly updates that we give to yourselves. So the next slide, um, we're going to talk through the the process, um, but I think it's important to to note as well that uh, with this process, there's additional uh, presentations available on the website, uh, which go through the whole remediation options process that we've been working through, um, and that those slides are available there in the QR code. And I think what's important as well is the the workshop that we went through last week on the, the 10th of April with um, elected members is also now on our on our website. So there's, you know, a lot more information and slides and I'm able to present here given the, the time constraints with, with what we have today. So hopefully those will be useful. Uh, next slide. So the next slide is an overview of, of where we are in this um, remediation process. So we started off with detailed site investigation. So I think this is something we covered in our, our last update to yourselves back in September. So there were, back in May 22, we concluded the last round of the uh, site investigations, uh, and that included an extensive uh, number of boreholes across the site. Um, and also with that, over seven years, at that, at that time, over seven years of monitoring data by NIEA, uh, and that culminated and, and having as much information as is reasonably possible across the site. We took we took a lot of advice as well from the Curtis Town site in terms of ensuring that we have as much information as possible so that we can have a robust uh, scientific basis for moving through the process and looking at the options available to us for remediation. That then moved on to uh, that information from the site investigations to the uh, what we call detailed quantitative risk assessment uh, and that is that risk assessment that looked at all the source pathways and, and assessed the risk in, in great detail and provided that real robust scientific uh, basis for moving forward. And the next step in that process which is uh, I should say as well is that it's an LCRM process which we refer to that, that acronym which stands for land contamination risk management uh, and that is UK statutory guidance uh, which we are following through on this process so the remediation options appraisal process is i'll go through in, in a wee bit more detail as we go through the presentation but that's really taking all of the information from the site investigations risk assessment and looking at the options across the site and then we're moving on into the the, the development of the optimum remediation strategy um, so the consultation on that draft optimum remediation strategy is a real integral part of the land contamination risk management process um, and the draft strategy has been developed following the options appraisal process uh, and the launch of that consultation uh, is under consideration and we'll provide further details on that in, in the coming weeks. The consultation is, is really, really important um, and there won't be any agreed option until that consultation is completed. Next slide. So the next slide, before we start, you know, looking at any feasible remediation options, it's really, really important that we have clear um, 
clear objectives set for, for the outcome of the process. I'm really, I'll not read through those, but those are the strategic objectives of the remediation uh, process. Um, and at the heart of that is the protection of health and the environment. Next slide. So next slide, again, I'll not read through all of those, but just for, for information, there's there's uh, all of the information in terms of what was carried out through the, the ground investigation. You can see there on the, the picture on the slide where there's a, a number of green dots, and that indicates just all the points across the site where there were boreholes drilled. So there was over 140 boreholes, and then also with the, the groundwater monitoring that I talked about. Uh, there were soil samples and the permeability testing on, on all of the the list of things there, including gas monitoring. Um, so, and there was also, as I mentioned before, the water. There was water bodies on the site, um, and those water bodies also had boreholes drilled in them, checking for for waste under it. So, it's just to give a real overview of the the uh, site investigations um, that that were carried out. All of that again is detailed, you know, in the detailed quantity of risk assessment, and and that's published on our website. Next slide. So the next slide, the next slide there is, is a, a slide showing the, how the site was divided up. So we're all aware, I said at the, at the beginning, how you, you know the size of the site is 46 hectares. Um, there's a lot, it's a complex site. So in terms of being able to assess the site really um, in great detail, it was necessary to break it down into zones and the site was broken down into, into 10 zones. Um, and really assessed as if it was 10 mini sites within one site. And that was really to ensure that we looked at all the, the different types of waste, the risks involved and the linkages there. Um, and that was gripped. So that was really just show, just depicting the, the level of detail that that assessment went through. Next slide. So all of those, so what I've talked about with the risk assessment and the options appraisal, these are um, our detailed reports that are also published on our website. So we've provided those on the slide for uh, a QR code where you can go into to more detail on those. Uh, each of those is really a presentation in its own right. So it's really given just an overview of setting the scene of, of the process that we've been working through. And then next slide. So the next slide again is looking at you know this process where we talk it's a three stage process. So LCRM starts off with looking at the risk assessment, which is completed, um, and then the stage two is the options appraisal, which is we're here to talk about in, in, in a wee bit more detail, and then we're moving into stage three, which is the development of the strategy, um, and then the delivery of that as part of that process. Uh, so it's really like a, a prognosis and options, and then how to deal with it. So next slide. So the next slide is focusing in on the remediation options appraisal. So the remediation options appraisal um, process is also three steps. So it's really you're looking at the feasible options for remediation, then the evaluation of those options and selecting that option. And in that process, sustainability is really what will underpin pin any remediation strategy. Um, and really, we look at the, what is sustainable remediation. So sustainable remediation uh, is the elimination and or control of unacceptable risks in a safely manner whilst optimizing the environmental, social and economic value of the work. And what's depicted there on the, the slide is the three the three elements that make up that sustainability. So we're looking at the environment, the social elements, and also the economics. And it's really important that all those three work together. And you'll see as they work together, the picture depicts the central sweet spot, if you like, where the sustainability. Um, each one of those factors, be the environment, social, and the economics, um, must have, have equal weighting in the process. Uh, so it's really about a real balance between those three to ensure that sustainability is at the heart of it. 
Um, and what's really, really important as well, sustainability is not something that you can you can add on in the end. It really must be an integral part of, of how the remediation strategies are, are selected and, and then carried out. So if we just maybe move on to looking at really how that, um, what that means for the project and the remediation options appraisal for Maboy. So we started off with the, from as we enter into the remediation options appraisal process, we start off with the robust scientific basis from the detailed risk assessment. Um, and then we're looking at what's called a multi-criteria analysis. And what that is, is a real structured system for ranking the alternatives for remediation and, and making those selections and decision. Uh, and the multi-criteria analysis uses a system of assigning scores uh, and the scores are assigned comparing options against each other uh, against a clear specified criteria. Um, and I do understand, you know, when we're going through this, it's it's quite complicated even to explain, which is which is really why we really welcomed the, the workshop where we went through you know, this in detail. But what's really important is that it is very much um, a comparative process. So you're comparing different options against um, very detailed criteria, which covers across those three elements of looking at the environment, looking at the social, and also looking at the economic. So with the, with the Mumbai site, as I outlined, we have 10, we have 10 zones across the site. Um, and then for each zone, we assessed each zone individually. Um, so there's over a hundred, over a hundred remediation options, uh, uh, options put on the table to be assessed. Um, and each of those options assessed um, across each zone with 46 criteria. And those 46 criteria um, covered those three elements of environment, social and economic. So you can imagine when you when you think of 10 zones, 46 sub criteria and those three topics, we ended up with a, a huge matrix of scoring uh, and those scoring you know, were not, you know, they, weren't, they weren't carried out by ourselves, they were carried out by our integrated consultancy team and experts in the remediation and contaminated land field. Uh, they were carried out by three, three remediation experts independent of each other and then they come together for a process of, of coming up with agreed scores. Uh, so it was, a, it was a very complex and, and detailed process, um, it culminated in, in a large matrix of scores covering all those areas. If we go to the next slide. So really if we can um, extend that a wee bit further in terms of the, the notice of motion and the questions um, posed in that, so the questions posed uh, across uh, the remediation options appraisal criteria uh, were really focused on the, the economic element of it. Uh, there was two or two of the questions on the social. So it, it is really important that each, you know, every, each part of the, 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 each factor is given equal weighting to ensure that again, as I said, we meet that sustainability. Um, it's, this process um, that we're in with LCRM is, is not an economic appraisal um, and the process doesn't require detailed costings. Uh, so it's very much a comparative process. And I have got a, you know, one snapshot of one part of it to work through, which will hopefully help to clarify that. Um, so the, allowing that comparison process is it allows comparison of a broad range of sustainability indicators. Um, including those that can't be quantified. You know, for example, on the social, we look at things about the you know, impact on neighbour, traffic, noise, so that there's not a number or a figure to be put with that. So it's making sure that then each of those elements is assessed in, in the same and equal way, so that, the again, we meet that sustainable uh, aim. So the remediation options appraisal report uh, details that appraisal process, and that's on our website. I appreciate it is really detailed. Um, and that's why we really welcome the, the workshop. And again, that presentation from the, the workshop is, is there on the QR code. Um, and we really want to thank the, the members for, for attending that and giving us the opportunity to go through that detail, which we hope um, was useful in terms of providing some background and understanding with what is um, quite complex. So the next slide. 
Next slide is pull it is a pull it out just some of which is a table which is within the report itself. But I think it was an important one just to show um, particularly on the, the economic where the, the focus of the questions are that it's not just about you know the the cost of the remediation. It's it's much wider. You know, it's looking like things like the you know the employment, um, employment capital and just economic benefits. So it's a much wider economic um, uh, look at the whole options appraisal process. But again, it's not an economic um, assessment that comes comes later in the business case, which I will explain. So the next slide. Next slide is one I've just really honed in on one of the tables within the report, of which there are, are many. Um, and this one is looking at, for example, so one of the criteria is looking at direct economic costs, and that was then broken down into direct financial costs uh, for building the remediation scheme. It looked at future maintenance uh, and discharge of liabilities. And the way that those are compared, for example, we had off-site disposal and then we have excavation and relocation. And what we mean by excavation and relocation is that waste uh, is excavated from the site that it is. It's sorted. Um, there's recyclables taken from it and extracted and sent for recycling. There's some of the material reused on site um, and then there's some material which would have to go for off-site disposal. So when you look at comparing those against those economic factors, um, you can see the score in there for the like, direct financial cost um, for offsite disposal is ranked as one, which was very high. And again, that relocation process and the way it's been reusing on site um, is still a significant cost, and it was scored at 1.7. So, it, but it's very much a comparative process. Um, and then just moving down through, I mean, looking at their discharge of liabilities, if we look at offsite disposal. Um, the score of five comparative to the, the, the 3.7 is really the five is that um high it's the discharge of liabilities is i'm not even reading can't read it's high cost and then the, the other one is relative to that so it's a very much a relative process uh, and that's just really a snapshot of one of the criteria to try and explain it a, a wee bit further so the next slide next slide is then really the, the output of that process. Um, so all of the looking at all of the criteria across all the different radiation options and across the zones. Um, and I keep talking about picking an option. This site, given the size of it, the complexities of it, there's no one option that's going to, you know, it's going to fit at all. It's looking at a really an integrated approach. Um, so for example, there we've got for zone four, and zone four is an area of the site. Um, with, where the A6 will interject the site um, and that waste will need to be removed from that area. Uh, but the primary option there is that remove the waste uh, on this process. This is what's come out as a primary option. Remove the waste, process it, remove the recyclables and then some reuse elsewhere on the site. But there will be some off-site disposal. So it's not just that there's just one option. There'll be an element of an integrated solution and all that um, needs to be worked through. So. That table on the on the screen is also within the remediation options appraisal, but it outlines just the different primary and secondary options across each of the site, and then how that will then need to be integrated to be brought forward to the the strategy, which uh, will be then will be subject to consultation. Okay, the next slide. So. After all of all of that, really, it's to home circle back and thinking about the process that we're looking at here on the radiation options as part of this um, that I keep referring to LCRM, and that is really looking at feasible options um, from a technical perspective and from the environment and, and all those factors that we've talked about. Um, and it's not a detailed economic appraisal. The costings and the detail around the costings certainly will come, but they are part of the, the business case process. So it's two different processes. Normally, what would happen is you, you know, the run in parallel, you'll go through and you find what your option is and then you develop the business case. We are working on the business case in parallel, um, but the business case uh, is, is a draft and working draft and it won't, can't be completed until the consultation is complete on the, and, and on the remediation option, optimum remediation strategy, uh, and then 
you know, an option selected. So it's very much two separate processes. And I think that's really the, the key message we're, we're trying to, to get across to explain just why there aren't exact figures within that LCRM process, because it, it's not necessary. Next slide. So the next slide is really just, there was, there's some um, environmental information requests around this remediation options appraisal and, and our answers to that. And we've just provided the, the links to those, which members may find useful. Um, so it's really for reference there. So hopefully you'll be looking at the presentation on the workshop and also the, the run through that, that I'm doing here, that those answers will, will, will then um, mean a lot more when, when you can read them. Next slide. And I think you know this is the, the 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 last slide, but I think what is absolutely vitally important um, is you know we're working through this process and we're talking about options appraisal remediation strategy, but what is vitally important is that um, protection of public health and the drinking water, and it's to reassure members that that extensive environmental monitoring program is ongoing. It's ongoing every day. You know, water from the rivers tested every day. We keep working with Northern Ireland Water, so um, that itself I think we've provided numerous updates and we'll continue to do so to provide um, that assurances and the message uh, from that is the to date the monitoring showed no impact on the river Fahan. however there is no room for complacency on that um, and that environmental monitoring um, is key and is, is a priority and that takes me to the end of the presentation so happy to pause and take any questions Thank you, Claire, for, for that very detailed presentation. Um, I'll open it now to members. Um, Sir Alex Duffy. Uh, Cormier, good chair, and thank you, Claire, for the presentation. It's it's nice to see you back in the chamber again. Um, no, uh, Sinn Féin would just like to uh, just to, to give our appreciation to, to you and your team for all the work you've been doing on it. Uh, unfortunately, we know that my boy is not going to be a quick fix. Uh, it's going to be a, a long, drawn out process. Uh, but there, there is progress being made, and we just we need to remember about that. Um, I suppose I have I have one question just regarding the the security of the site because it was brought up within um, this meeting a few a few months ago as well, uh, and there was. Um, it was a concern at that time too about it. Just uh, if uh, you use yourselves doing anything to address that, uh, I would be quite frequently up around that area, and I've just noticed early as last week that it's, it's it was lying open. Um, we know that padlocks keep being removed, and people are getting on the dump, and the dump, what is about uh, concerning. Uh, just to, to see what you are doing, and I suppose the same question they they. Council as well to see if, if anything has been uh, put in place with the um, community safety wardens. Uh, they put it up on their route when they're passing, perhaps, or even the rural policing team or something like that. They, because uh, it has a risk and part of it is about protecting the site users, and it's not been done at the moment. It was lying open. Thank you. Yeah, through the chair. Yeah, thank you. Um, can I start off with your question? And yes, absolutely. We, we um, I, you'll notice from the monthly update, you know, we're, we're providing an update on that security. And we are on the site every single week as part of the extensive monitoring program um, and the site security with those padlocks being um, tampered with and the gate actually cut. Um, it is us that's, that's repairing those. Um, it's an ongoing issue. Uh, we've also been in discussions you know, with, with council officers just in investigating other anything else that can be done we need are very mindful that we do not own the site um we're there uh, taking samples and monitoring etc under the water order um so our limitations uh, the limitations on our legal advice is that we don't have the virus to install cctv uh that's something we, we, we're, we're revisiting we're discussing with council with uh, council officers um but it's it's certainly something and in terms of the the risks uh, we've recently removed some um, flight type waste, which was within the site um, because of the, the risk to fire. We work closely with the fire service. We have them on the site regularly and continue to meet with them. Uh, and that was one of their recommendations. So 
uh, we've taken that forward and removed it. So it's it's an ongoing issue that we're we're actively, you know, doing what we can within our within our fireys. Just for you, Chair, if you don't mind. Just to clear, uh, at the moment you're saying that uh, well, we understand that you obviously don't own the site, we we know that. But at the moment, liability, who would liability lie with if there is any? Uh, go for about any accidents or anything on the site by trespassers when it's lying unsecured? I believe the liability lies with the current owners and I'll double check that with our, our solicitors and, and come back to you to confirm that. Members, just through you, Chair, um, uh, Council officers, as Claire said, are, are working with the deer. Obviously, we don't own the site. We have removed some um, waste that was fly tipped outside of the site. And indeed, we've organised for our enforcement officers to drive past as much as they can and, and then report in any issues that they've seen. But um, really, we don't have any um, any role actually on the site as such. But we certainly are more than happy and we, we engage with deer regularly in relation to the site. Okay, um, next speaker is Alderman Middleton. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Claire and team, for being here, and also for the workshop the other day, which was hugely helpful for me as a new councillor. Um, the, the extensive nature of the site um, has been something that's really concerned me for a long time, but the extensive work that's been done has been very reassuring, certainly for us as the DEP team. Um, to echo Councillor Duffy's point, we rec recognise this isn't a quick fix, but um, we're really looking forward to seeing progress and, and we're thankful for the progress that has already been made. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. And Councillor Harkin. Yeah, uh, thank you for coming in today and doing the presentation. And it's uh, it's much needed. And look, I, I think that um, one question I would have, and I'm going to ask a few, is, I mean, Stormont is back and functioning now, and I'm wondering if you feel like that that is making any difference to the uh, to moving this forward. Um, I mean, I, I don't think that public the public feels like this is being acted on quickly enough. I mean, it's been exposed now for more than a decade. There was talk even back in 2017 of a plan being put in place to, to deal with that. And that, that's nearly a decade ago now. So uh, I think that there's a lot of frustration that we haven't moved a lot faster to deal with this. And there's repercussions and consequences for not uh, dealing with this quicker. Um, so, you know, it doesn't make a difference that the executive is up and functioning to uh, getting remediation uh, moving forward. The second question is, again, about... So my understanding is that the the council or the the work on the remediation options was done last year, and that that con the consultation about those remediation options was supposed to begin in the autumn of last year. So one question is is that accurate to say that? And then if if so, why is it delayed now? Um, and then the third question is on uh, the the consultation itself which I think, look, I appreciate that it's been emphasised that no proposal will move forward until there is a thorough uh, consultation done uh, with stakeholders, residents, and, and uh, uh, you know, anybody that has a concern with the future of the Maboy uh, dump. Um, but there is concern around the proposals that, that some of the waste around the river, particularly, uh, may not be removed. Um, and I want to, I think that on behalf of the people that are concerned about that, I want to get agreement that if the consultation process uh, concludes that there is, a, 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 you know, across the board agreement that uh, excavation needs to happen of waste that is close to the river. And obviously it's not just there, but this is a particular concern that, that some people have, that that will uh, shape what happens. Thank you. Okay, if I can take that through the chair. Um, so again, thank you for your question. Thanks for the um, opportunity to be here today. Um, I think in terms of, of your first question, um, I think it, it, it's, it's hugely important that we have um, the administration back and we are working through from our perspective as officials uh, the, the important information around the consultation to be able to bring that to you, Minister. So I think that is, is really important that 
we take the time to to work through that um and to be able to provide that that advice in relation to consultation so from from our perspective um i see that as hugely hugely positive um in terms of the the consultation itself um yes we have been working through that we hoped that we would have be able to work through it a, a bit quicker but that hasn't been possible so we're, we're just going through the, the different details there's been a lot of changes uh both at a um from a, an organizational perspective and also uh, continuing to gather any information that, that that's required for that consultation so certainly it is our, our, our view that we'll be working through that as quickly as possible because we realize that the consultation is a, a really important aspect uh, for for members here and for 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 everyone that's uh, involved and and engaged in in this um, area, and then in relation to the the consultation itself, um, the, the the consultation will specifically look at the the remediation options uh, th th that are there, and will also uh, give indication of of the balance that we've talked about through the LCRM process, and Claire's has gone through that. Um, it's really important to fulfill that whole process that, that consultation is carried out. So um, there's undoubtedly a, a very specific focus on that. However, as we as we go to consultation, we do expect that there will be other um, other issues raised through that, and we will we will um, have to to look at those and answer those as well in relation to how we uh, how we take any uh, process forward. But uh, again, I would just like to reassure you around um, your comments. Absolutely essential that that um, there, there's a wider engagement in this, and you've seen the, the depth of of information that we, we've got. It's been so important for us to actually get that level of detail so that we know it as far as we can. I'll not say no um, to 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 uh, an absolute degree, but know as far as we can what we're dealing with. And then we can present that as a as a as a consultation. So certainly, we, we I, uh, very very conscious of your 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 comments, and certainly we can we can we can consider those as we're trying to get through the, to that to that decision making process. For you, chair. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. And look, the, the reason why I was asking about the executive being back up and running is it was very frustrating for people that there wasn't a government, and obviously a, a lot of stuff was delayed. Um, and uh, ministerial sign-off was needed for many different projects. And uh, there was just that suspension, really, of getting things done. And I think for you, yeah, you, you want to be able to get something to your minister. But, but what I'm asking about is, like, do you feel like there's encouragement coming to you to move as quickly as you can uh, now that the government is back and up and running? Because the, the, there's an issue here as well about dairy in the northwest, about uh you know we 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 have heard a commitment now to see uh issues that are of concern to this area uh dealt with as quickly as possible but that needs to like we want to see action so i think people are fed up with like promises and then no very very slow moving action or no action at all so that's why i was asking about because i would like to think that somebody would be in your ear saying we want to move forward as quickly as possible on this and we are going to help make that happen uh, because we know that people in Derry uh, and, and in the North West, or West have been very concerned about this for a long time and are quite agitated about it and I'm sure you want to get it uh, moved forward with as well. And then the second one really is about, yeah, look, I think that the the I appreciate that new information came in but that, but that people were expecting to be able to debate out remediation options quite a while ago um, and that didn't happen. So there has to be some accountability about like when we say we're going to have a consultation and then it, and then the date moves and so many dates uh, in relation to issues for dairy and, 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 and the Northwest seem to be moved constantly, whether it is the train tracks or whether it is, uh, you know, dealing with my boy. So that's that's why I asked that particular question. It is it is it was on record that the the, the remediation, the consultation on the on the remediation options would start in the autumn, and then and and now we're, uh, it's it's uh, you know there's another date probably a year on from that that will be put forward. Um, the the last question I have, if it's okay, chair, is about just in terms of there's been some concerns raised about. The need for a, a, an environmental impact assessment on the road aspect 
of uh, the A6. And I, I'm wondering what your views are on that in, ter in relation to the Maboy dump. Again, uh, through the chair. Um, so uh, we work very closely with our, our DFI colleagues uh, in relation to the, the, the road scheme. And, uh, you know, it, we will take whatever steps and they will take whatever steps are, are required around that. They, we have a, a project board of which I, I lead and they are um, a, an integral part of that project board. So, again, we will take whatever steps we need to do that in order to ensure that we are in compliance with 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 any requirements and just to to, to make a comment on your the first question again if i may um i can confirm that the minister has visited the site uh, and is 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 uh, hugely in, in, interested in in what what is going on in relation to uh, the remediation options, et cetera. So certainly there is, is no lack of, of momentum in relation to ourselves and uh, on this, and we will be uh, doing our very best to, to move forward as quickly as possible. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sean. And Councillor Raymond Barr. Thank you, Chair. The one question I was going to ask was already in the consultation, but that's been covered in uh, Councillor Harkin's question. And in relation to the questions and the motion, we had a fairly extensive conversation around that at the workshop. So I'm not going to take up any more of your time asking to go over that again. So uh, just on that, I'd like to thank the team for coming here today as well. Thank you. Thanks, Raymond. And Councillor uh, Norris. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, all, Claire, John, and Richard. Uh, as Sunday has attended nearly all the workshops, you know, uh, it's this is a very complex. Uh, situation, you know, and like even looking at all the criteria and what you're going through to get to here, I've only really so we. I'm right in saying you are ready now for the public consultation. We're just waiting on the minister to rubber stamp it. Uh, we're we're still working through the the information and advice to go to minister. So um, we're we are just trying to finalise that as quickly as we can. Well, for you, Chair. Uh, so how long do you think, Richard? Are we talking like a year? Are we talking months or no? Is it, are, are we, do we actually know? So I'd, you, you'll not be surprised I'm not going to put a time scale on it because it, we're, we're, we're uh, I'll be probably back up here very quickly. Sorry, through the chair. Um, but but we are there is momentum with this, and we will be moving forward as quickly as we as possible. And I I wouldn't like to be here in a year's time uh, still talking about the consultation getting out. Uh, so like like lower councillors, like I'm a resident, as you know, and obviously the Fahan DA councillor, we're all concerned. I, like and. Like when you go through the quantitative risk assessment, you go through all this sort of assessments. As I said, it's very, very complex, and like, and something trying to work it out is very, very difficult. So, like for residents, I, I, I can only urge to get to that public consultation. You know, because residents are concerned, and we want it out. And it's, as Councillor uh, Harkin said, it's a long time coming. You know, so we. We, we really need to, like us as SDLP, like we have a two path. We we are pushing for a public inquiry and we don't want to hold, like that has to go in a parallel. And Mark Hitch has already requested that in Stormont. But as a councillor, we really need to get this stuff out, you know, and or in whatever way we we, we decide. But again, as Councillor Harkin said, like we have to be concerned for the river, we have to be concerned for everything. So it has to get to that recommend it or the decision that everybody's agreeing with and we can only do that through public consultation you know thank you chair just to 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 again just to provide reassurance around that um and, and claire mentioned the ongoing work that we're doing in terms of monitoring of the of the site um so we're we're you know fully committed to, to maintaining that and ensuring that they they um all the work that we're doing around uh, water monitoring and site monitoring goes on. So there is that reassurance around that, but certainly I, I hear very clearly your comments uh, in relation to maintaining the momentum. Okay, and Alderman Hossey. 
Well, thank you, Chair. Thank you uh, for the presentation. Uh, just a query with regard to the scatter graph of your boreholes. Is it true to say that they're all actually on site? And uh, the reason I'm asking that is I had heard, uh, like Councillor Norris, I'd been at some of the workshops down in Everton or Eglinton. Um, there was concern that there may be other areas that haven't been identified. So was there any boreholes uh, beyond the actual site? And that would be one reason. The other reason would be, as was the process of osmosis, uh, you know, if there is a, a leaching through, that will actually spread outwards beyond the site, obviously, which is the concern, but not necessarily just towards the river, but to ground beyond the actual site. So was there any testing beyond the site? Thank you. Through the chair, yeah. Thank you, Councillor, for your for your um, question. Uh, the answer is, is is yes. So we, in terms of the investigations outside of the the site boundary, the boreholes you're right with on the in the diagram all are, are within the site. There were trial pits um, dug on adjacent land on around the site where we had some anecdotal evidence of potentially of going beyond that, um, and we found that there there was no waste in those trial pits that we dug. Um, in terms of the, you know, the groundwater, there's extensive modelling done within the detailed quantitative risk assessment, um, looking at those flows and conceptual site models and modelling. So all of that is very much part of the risk assessment. Thank you, Alderman. I have no further indicated speakers, so I'm going to bring in uh, Karen. Thank you, Chair and members. Just to provide you with a bit of an update. I know members you did agree um, at council to uh, for council to, to be very active in terms of considering the uh, the consultation on the, the draft remediation strategy and to actually appoint an expert on council's behalf in order to actually look at that document once it is finally released. Um, and just to provide you with an update members that we are in the process of going through that procurement process that actually finishes on Friday of this week. Um, and the, the officer team will then um, undertake uh, consideration of um, a potential uh, partner uh, in order to actually undertake that work and also potential costs. So we will bring that back to members uh, now as soon as we possibly can following um, the, the close of the consultation pe period or the procurement period on Friday. So just to provide members with that information, because I know certainly and members were very keen that we uh, very clearly and robustly um, considered the options for mediation strategy that the department are putting forward and make sure that the council have the advice necessary to be able to provide a consultation response that's fully informed. So thank you, Chair. Thanks, Karen. Um, just um, was there anything more you, you would like to say or or we bring? Uh, no, just simply to thank you for the the opportunity to come forward, and we're we're very glad to to give the the ongoing updates and um, come back and give an update if that's uh, what the the members request. Thank you. Yeah, well, just as as chair of the committee, I want to thank you once again for coming on and presenting to the committee today. And and as you say, um, no doubt we'll see each other again in the future. So thanks for coming. Thank you.
Okay, members. Um, I think we're all set to go now with our second presentation. So we'd just like to, to welcome um, or receive the presentation from the Department for Communities regarding the inner walled city public realm. And we're joined today by Pauline Campbell yeah, from DFC, uh, Eleanor Fuller from the All Hogarth Company, and Paul McNutt as well, representing DFC as well. Yeah, so we have. Okay, uh, thank you all very much for inviting us here today to give an overview of the Inner Wall City Public Realm project. Uh, I'm the SRO for the project, um, Pauline's investment decision maker, and Elner was one of the designers. So uh, the way we're going to do, I'm going to take through a brief history of the project and how we got to where we are today. And then I'm going to hand over to Elner, who's going to take you through the slides and actually give you an overview of the actual project itself and what it will deliver. So basically, the Inner Wall City Public Realm is a 5.1 million pound project to transform a number of streets adjacent to the historic city walls and is the department's largest investment in a public realm project since the completion of the Guildhall Square and Waterloo Place scheme in 2010. The initial considerations for this project actually started way back in 2011 in advance of the city of culture. At that stage, the department was delivering a range of public realm projects across the city and carried an audit out of its streetscapes. We identified that this area needed substantial high quality intervention due to its location and condition. The public realm within the project area is not in keeping with that of a popular and vibrant uh, city centre location. The existing public realm was installed in the mid 1990s and is now demonstrating significant, significant deterioration in quality. Therefore, instead of a quick fix in advance of the city culture, it was decided that a more transformative change would be developed. An integrated consultancy team was appointed in December 2014. At the time, it was White Young Green who have subsequently been taken over by Tetratech. And the Paul Hoger company were appointed as the landscape architects who developed the setting for the scheme. As I say, Eleanor's here representing them today. Following the, the appointment, we embarked on an extensive consultation throughout 2016, and this culminated in a public consultation of our museum. Uh, groups representing those with a disability had particular interest in the scheme. At one stage, we were actually going to make it a completely shared surface scheme, uh, but we uh, that doesn't meet their requirements. So we had to make various uh, amendments to the design to meet their needs. After the consultation, we submitted a full plan application. However, as there's no assembly in place at the time, and as, as we didn't have access to multi-year budgets, we could not secure funding at that stage. Therefore, the consultancy team were stood down in 2018. Uh, following the establishment of the assembly, obviously we were dealing with COVID in the first instance. Uh, so it wasn't until May 21 that the consultants recommenced work. Our minister at the time, Deirdre Hargy, then approved funding for the project in October 22, and the business case was approved in that November. Following the procurement exercise, a recent procurement exercise, can now advise that we have recently appointed FP McCann as the contractor for the scheme. We worked, we previously worked with FP McCann on the, the, the Guildhall Square and Waterloo Square scheme as well. FP McCann are due to start on site this summer, and construction will last for 18 months, completing in early 2026. We've actually recently amended the scheme following further consultation with st stakeholders in the Society Street and Palace Street area. The original intention was to replace the Society Street car park with a public park. But due to concerns raised by local stakeholders, we have now agreed to retain a 20 space car park. Eleanor will we'll get into a bit more detail on, on the actual design of that uh, in her presentation. It's fair to say it's taken us a while to get here, but I'm looking forward to seeing this project delivered on the ground, making a much needed transformative, transformative change to this area of the city. So I'll now hand over to Eleanor, who will actually go through the detail of the scheme. Thank you, Paul. Um, I have just a few slides that cover a bit of the history and then a, a few slides showing the, the proposals. Um, so if I go to the next slide, um, this next slide should show, it's, if you can see it on the screen, um, the, the project area. Um, just to sort of briefly walk you around it to, to orientate yourselves, we've, we've start on the the right hand side um, at the back of the Millennium Forum and then we follow the streets around the inside of the city walls across Shipkey Street and along Union Hall Place to the Tower Museum. It then turns up um, and heads up the hill along Magazine Street um, past Butcher's Gate through um, carrying on along Magazine Street to the Memorial Hall 
and then that's where it, it sort of splits into the two the two legs one down society street and one down palace street which is the very narrow um vehicle route uh which it links up to what is currently the car park um which is the larger area of of the space so mainly we're talking about quite narrow streets um so the next slide please um yeah, and these are just a few snapshots, which I guess really just depict the what Paul was saying about the quality and the condition of the the streets in these areas. There's a variety of different surfaces and patch repairs and and different material um, in place. And the next slide, please. It shows the next slide actually then picks up some of the integrity and the quality of the site, which as obviously the big the big selling ticket is the walls themselves and the the fact that they're a scheduled monument and probably the most um, arguably one of the most important, if not the most important, intact scheduled monument in Northern Ireland. Um, so it's about trying to work with the quality, but improve where things have um, fallen into a slight state of disrepair. So next slide, please. Um, next, actually, the next slide again, this is just putting it in context with the streets that have already been improved in the centre um, to a high standard. And that's the Diamond, Shipkey Street, um, Bishop Street and uh butchers the street up to butchers gate um next slide please uh and the next yeah this is just a couple of those shots which um represent the materials that have been used on those streets which is a cave nest stone for the footpaths and a granite stone for the curbs both are very robust very high quality stone um which performs extremely well in urban conditions and particularly situations like this in town centers they're used quite extensively across um, Ireland and the UK. It's Caithness is a Scottish stone and well, granite can come from a variety of places. Um, but the intention is to match in with this and, and basically extend that quality and that material palette into the streets that we're talking about. Um, so next slide, please. It's quite hard to see on the screen up there, but uh, this is the, the the diagram which shows the the extent. Um, I think I'll just jump straight onto the next slide because I think that will help a little bit more. Um, so on the the left hand side of the screen, we have two two examples of what the street will look like, um, uh, and then on the right, some of the materials and the finishes. So the 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 footpaths will all be finished with the Caithness stone, which which you can see on Shipkey Street. Um, the curbs will be the same granite as Shipkey Street, and then the carriageway will be finished with another type of granite. So you end up with a, a, a carpet floor, if you like, from wall to wall, which is high quality new stone. Um, the intention is to reduce the width of the carriageway where we can um, to allow for more room for pedestrians uh, and to just improve that environment for people using the space. The um, Next, the, the, the photos further down show the lighting. It's essentially the middle photo there, if you can see it, is actually from Palace Street. Um, and essentially we're, we're improving the lighting, upgrading it to LED um, and putting in a sort of monitoring sensor system, which allows a bit more control of the lighting. But essentially it will still follow the heritage character of what's in place already, which is, uh, I didn't mention this before, but I'm, you may all well be aware that it's a conservation area. So we're, we're, we're trying to keep in in keeping with that as well and um HED were quite involved in the the process as it went through planning um so I think next slide please um this then is a a, a zoom in of the the car park and the space next to it so the previous plans as Paul suggested did include a, a green space here but through consultation it it became apparent that the parking was um felt to be quite an important aspect for the local traders in the area. So we came up with a plan here, which takes out just one parking space, but in taking out one and reconfiguring two, we have able to create a, a bigger space for pedestrians here, um, which can double up as an event space. And also we have in, introduced a bit more planting, a bit more greenery into the area, um, which uh, there's a lot of a lot of benefit to that, um, not least with the um, from a sort of biodiversity net gain, and also from um, generally getting greenery into cities. Is with the climate change that's coming is brings on a lot of advantages as well. So it's a small win, but it still offers benefit there. Um, 
and yes slight narrowing of the the road widths where again where possible is just creating a more comfortable space for pedestrians um one thing paul mentioned that i think it's worth we we went through quite a thorough consultation with disability groups um so curb show and crossing points and things like that have all been quite thoughtfully detailed with their requirements in mind um so where a lot of the crossings onto the wall will now once it's finished we'll have tabletop flush crossing points um the curb show will be consistent in it, for different streets and different scenarios but the only section which will be flush is the section of union hall place which is as existing so we're we're just maintaining what's there um in that regard and i think next slide is is the last one which just takes us back to the the oh no sorry i tell a lie there's a cross section here which is through gives you an idea of that that's a section through where the planter is on the the previous plan so it shows you there's a bit more greenery areas for seating and and then there's the one of the parking bays and then the road itself so it just gives you a bit of a feel for the the quality of that space um and then the next one is the final slide which just um takes you back to the full plan uh and yeah i think that's that's a sort of whistle stop tour but happy to take any questions okay, okay uh, thanks very much i've just come on for three final yeah. points just to just pick up a couple of things that i uh following elner um as Eleanor said, the, these streets are very tight, so it's been very difficult to get in. Uh, a lot of the footpaths don't meet current standards. We are trying to widen the footpaths as much as possible throughout the scheme, so hopefully that will allow them for cafe culture. We are uh, removing on street parking as much as possible. There is six uh, parking bays on Magazine Street, and they'll just below uh, Castle Gate, so there'll be six parking bays there. There will be three parking bays on Society Street, and we will be uh, putting in a loading bay as well, so outside the Memorial Hall uh, there. So we, we're allowing for parking, but we're trying to discourage the on-street parking as much as possible. As I said, we are retaining the car park now on Society Street, so there will be 20 spaces there as well. Okay, and happy to take any questions. Okay, uh, Councillor McGillan indicated. Can I get here, and thank you, uh, Paul, Eleanor, and Pauline for that presentation. Um, this is something I've taken significant interest on. Uh, Tony Monaghan's not here today, but I don't know how many times me and him have had conversations about it, because um, I know he's been involved in the consultation specifically and around the Society Street Care Park. Um, and I just want to thank you for engaging in that process. I know there was a lot of concerns that were raised a few months ago um, by traders because the pre initial consultation had been in 2016 and there have been renewed concerns. So um, really, really glad to hear that their concerns have been taken on board and the scheme can still go ahead with adaptations. Um, to suit those needs. I think it's positive that we're looking at massive investment in the city centre and moving towards that more pedestrianisation with the widening of footpaths, but not to the detriment of, of people that need their parking where, where it's needed. So it's just really to thank you on behalf of the Sinn Féin team. I, I think that engagement is really, really key to, to making this successful. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. I have Councillor Mark McGinley. Thanks very much, <laughs> Chair. Uh, can I uh, can I also welcome everyone to the chamber and thank you for the presentation. It's good to see you. Uh, also, Chair, just uh, through you to record apologies for Councillor Boyle, uh, who had hoped to be able to be here today to speak to this item, but isn't. Um, uh, but as Councillor McGinley has said, uh, there has been uh, a lot of interest in this issue uh, over uh, the past decade or so. It, it struck me when you were outlining Paul. The history of it, it, it reminded me of some of the flagstones that are checkered and, and need um, uh, need replaced in terms of the, the, the bumpy road that it has got to get to where we are today. But um, it is good to see um, the, the presentation and the plans. I suppose a couple of questions uh, through you, Chair. Um, in relation to the, um, the granite finish, um, I think it is worth noting that it is it's good to see this proposal um, the the finish being uh, being reflective of the the city walls that are there and the the granite sets to the walls to be uh, to to match in and uh, I think that that is important that that, that we treat uh, the city walls with the respect that they uh, should deserve so uh, so uh, we're really keen to see uh, all of that replicated uh, you know in the in the piece of work going forward um, I suppose there's a query in relation to um, the finish uh, granite stone and the, the the work that you can do in advance with contractors to ensure that first of all that they don't have any 
um, reasons to be digging or or, or to uh, to be disrupting the work once this uh, stone is put down, and then what uh, assurances have we that if they are needing to break into the ground, uh, that they replace it at w with the same caliber uh, and consistency of what's there currently. Um, I suppose then, uh, following on from that, chair, the uh, the issues in relation to the. Uh, society car park uh, is is good to see that, there, that that's been retained i know that there are businesses in the area uh, who want to see that car parking uh, facility uh, opposite st augustine's church still still be there so so that's positive to see um and chair there's um just a, another point uh that i wanted to make in relation to the uh the items the um, uh, the the scheme had included in uh, I think in the past there had been some discussion around um, uh, public art being placed on the ground at some of the steps in the map there at uh, the back of the Millennium Forum uh, that the in the same way we have uh, around the city some very good uh, public art uh, graffiti style art on walls and uh, some of the steps in the area would lend themselves to that type of um, public art um, and whether or not that has been uh, incorporated in in any of the design work would be would be useful to know chair so happy to throw out those questions and, and hear what people have to come back with but uh, positive to see and and well done to for getting at this stage and also for listening to those that have registered their concerns around the car parking issues that are there thanks chair yes through the chair um in terms of the consultations we've had uh, with contractors, uh, we've had a wide range of consultations way back as far as 2015, 2016, and then it was updated uh, recently. And you may have noticed that uh, NI Water were in a uh, bank place recently. That was as part of those, those consultations to make sure that they got that work completed in advance of it. So um, we've done our best to, to do it, Martin, but I'll, I'll be honest with you, uh, it will be, uh, they will have to come back at some stage. And at that stage, then they will be responsible for replacing it to the current standard. Now, this was really an issue for DFI to manage. We will keep an eye on it as well. We know there's ongoing problems. And in fact, I know, for example, in Shipkey Street, there's still a patch that utilities that probably about four or five years ago, where we actually end up with ourselves in DFI. We're going to end up fixing that shortly. Uh, so it's it's trying to keep on utilities. But uh, look, I'm not going to say it's going to be perfect. Uh, they have a responsibility to do it. DFI try to keep on top of them as much as possible, but it's it's an ongoing issue that we have. Uh, they, they will need to come in, but we've done as much as we can to make sure they're not coming in in the immediate future, but they will have to come in and restate it at some stage. In terms of the public art, yeah, there are a number of uh, public art, but they're actually uh, the bollards. So there'll be bollards um, outside, uh, at, down outside the Tower Museum where they're there. Now, a few of them will, will be removable bollards, so it'll just be your basic bollards that you'll lift and put in. But uh, the rest of them are going to be artistic bollards. There's going to be some outside the memorial hall uh, and at the steps there uh, uh, coming down from the walls. Uh, we are actually out to tender at the minute, and, and that completes that tender's due back. And yeah, yeah it'll be um, we've another eight weeks before we have the appointed uh, mm -hmm. artist. Uh, but there's it's a two-stage process, so we're we're nearing the end of the first stage, and then we'll be. Um, narrowing it down for selection, so we don't know exactly what we'll be getting yet, but that's um, that will be part of that that process. Uh, yeah. Could I just add? Sorry, yeah, just one other quite. thing on the the material. Um, part, through the contract, we there's a percentage that the contractor will have to get a surplus the, of the stone of the cave nest and the granite, so that they they there will be a, a small stock that's that's put put to one side for for reuse for repairs. Um, yeah, thank you for that. And and through you, Chair, just a quick point as well in relation to the time frame. Uh, we know that elsewhere in the city centre adjo uh, adjoining this is there's plans for work uh, to do with the uh, the, the Foy Street and, and and the relocation of the bus uh, when the Foy Street's getting dug up and so on. So in terms of conversations with other public bodies, how are we making sure that we're not um creating a bigger issue uh, in relation to any of the works that have been carried out in relation to that project thanks we've had regular discussions with ni water on that project um and yes it's probably not ideal that they're coming on at the same time but 
uh, the traffic management that they're going to have in place, it's going to be a significant uh, issue. The streets that we have uh, are working on are sort of supplementary streets, and it will be a phased process. So the idea will be we'll be phasing it for probably for the contractor still to finalise that four different phases. So we'll not be sealing off the whole area at the one time. So we're, we've already had those discussions and our contractor are aware of those as well. Okay, Martin. Uh, Alderman Middleton. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the team for being here. The presentation was very informative. It looks lovely. Um, I particularly like walking that exact route, so I'm excited to see the work that, that comes um, as you progress. Just a quick question. I know there are just a small number of residents on Palace Street um, who have concerns around parking. Um, they're okay to park maybe overnight, but once the, the ticket the ticket, I don't even know what the word is, the ticket inspectors come in the morning and um, their the concerns are going to be ticketed. Is there any uh, plans in place for such residents? Thank you. Um, ironically, the, the removal of the car park has probably made things a bit more difficult for them because when we were removing the car park, our intention was to introduce a, a permit only parking scheme through parking scheme throughout the entire area. Um, because the car parks, so DFI were going to put that in, you would have applied for it and they could have applied for a permit and used the parking bays because uh, nobody else should have been in that scheme unless you had a reason for loading or working or being a resident. By the fact that we were retaining the car park now, unfortunately, we can't introduce that scheme because people have a right to be in that area to access the car park. So now uh, this has been taken completely away from ourselves. Uh, there's nothing we really can do. I know that uh, there was a, it was going to be the, at the public meeting, there was a commitment that council will look internally and uh, to see if there's anything they could do in terms of the Society Street Car Park. But really, the Society Street Car Park is, is responsible to car, of council and the off-street parking will be responsible of, of DFI. So we could have maybe helped them if we hadn't removed the car park. So we benefit some of the stakeholders, but unfortunately now we, we can't do anything really on in terms of resident parking. Through you, Chair, members, just to um, update members further in relation to that point, I know I've spoke to the Director of Business and Culture and they, uh, Business and Culture, are going to bring a paper to next month's Business and Culture in relation to, I suppose, residents um, living near car parks across the, the city centre. Um, so members will get the chance to consider that further at that meeting. Councillor Harkin, had you indicated to me? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Chair, for letting me in and uh, thank you to the presenters today for coming in. And look, I think we have a unique city centre uh, that is, uh, I think it's a fantastic city centre, but anything that can improve it is welcome and modernise it and make it better. Um, and I think that, look, it's also welcome that a department is investing in the city centre because over the last couple of years, we've looked through our budgets in great detail and found uh, some departments wanting in terms of their uh, commitment to the public realm in particular, uh, DFA in particular, um, and that there could be a lot more done from a department level and the council ends up being uh, responsible for up, upkeep and doing things that it's not responsible for. I'm sure you're aware of that if you're if you're in Derry um, or listen to any of the council discussions. Uh, look, I, I think we've had a number of things in terms of changes to the city centre layout uh, backfire over the last couple of years. Many of them were well intentioned. Many of them were probably well trialed. Um, and I think I hope that this one goes better. And I and I really appreciate that uh, you know from the, from the department. Uh, it sounds, uh, and it, it, it's clear that you've been very sensitive to uh, concerns of traders, concerns of residents, concerns of uh, people, you know, eager to see green spaces, um, and, uh, you know, anyone concerned with heritage as well. And, and, and I think very importantly, uh, you know, listening to the concerns of people with disability uh, and organisations representing them. So, um, I, you know, I, this is good. And I and I uh, I'm not going to comment on the artistic um, level because you you need to kind of see it in order to kind of fully appreciate it, but the plans sound very very good, uh, and I think that's because there's been a proper consultation done, and I think that that helps a lot, um, and I, I look forward to this uh, improving the city centre. Thank you. So that's Sean and Alderman Hussey. Uh, thank you, Chair, um, and thanks for the presentation. I, I'm looking at the street stones, and I'm sure you'll agree, Chair, that uh, 
we we could take you to another town where <laughs> the patchwork exists exists something like this. I never I appreciate the difficulties that you you're working on. Uh, particularly Palace Street, uh, those of us who sometimes would try to progress along there, four abreast, suddenly have to move three abreast, going into that small area. Uh, looking down to, uh, I'm delighted that car parking space is being retained uh, within that area, within uh, Society Street, uh, Palace Street, uh, St Augustine's there. Uh, but I'm also looking at that. Is there parking being removed along the front of, of the mem right up to Ouija's at the corner because there has been traditionally parking there. Uh, so I'm assuming that, that parking is being removed from there. Uh, and a second point would be, there's there's the two blocks which sit in the middle of that. Was it ever considered the removal of those blocks to create more space there? In terms of Society Street, yeah, um, as I highlighted, there were three parking bays uh, at the at the bottom of Society Street, uh, opposite the Memorial Hall on the far side. There will be a loading bay outside the uh, Memorial Hall, but the rest of the street there will be no room for parking. And now when we engage with the stakeholders in that area, they were satisfied with that. Uh, and uh, if you look at those pavements at the minute, they're not fit for purpose. Uh, the, the, if you have a pram or anything or a wheelchair trying to get down, those are not. So by widening that footpath, you automatically prevent any parking on that street. Uh, but as I say, the stakeholders that we engage with, when they heard that we were retaining the car park, were, were satisfied. In terms of those two buildings, we did have discussions early on it, but I think one's an electric building and I think one's a, is one a council building and they are both currently needed. Uh, so look, if, if people had a came for, were happy to demolish it, that's fine. But uh, at the time that we discussed it back in 2016, uh, there was no appetite for that. Thanks for that, Chair. Okay, members, that's the the uh, end of the questions and discussions. There's no other member indicated. So again, just like to thank you again for your attendance and look forward to see the, the end product. Thank you. All right. Okay, members, uh, moving on then, item seven, the chair's business. I don't think there was any member that contacted me, and uh, you'd be happy to hear I have no chair's business. So, move on to item eight, which is the matters arising from our previous meeting. And I'll take them all at once. Uh, Alderman Kerrigan. Thank you very, very much, Chair. I have three, and I'll be very brief on them. Um, um, one of them is in regard to ER7624. But that also comes in as a ER eighty eight twenty four and confidential, so it's up to Connor if he wishes to give any brief update in regards to the recycling end in Castle Eric. He can either do it now or can do it in confidential. I know it was just that it's progressing, you know, as has was passed at the full council. If it's just as basic as that, it's grand. Um the the other one then uh is ER seventy two slash twenty four which uh, was raised uh, as in regards to the play facility at Kiln, and there was talk uh, when some of the Derek councillors had a meeting there with Colin uh, and uh, Helen and that, uh, that there might be an update here in regards to, uh, to do, we have, you had a discussion with Desi Thompson, and the last one would be ER82, which is um, in regards to burial costs that we had raised, and I'm just wondering, when uh, our board state that we'll come back on it, it's more so just keeping it on the agenda, or when we might have a wee update about potential costings possibly for, for uh, non residents. So that's the height of it. Thank you, Chair. Through you, Chair, members, if I can come in on those points and then the team can come further in if, if there's anything that they want to add. In terms of the recycling um, in Castle Derg, we are going to be bringing a report on next month that is process, uh, progressing and we're currently looking the, at the options as per the agreement at full council last month. In terms of Kiln, the, yes, the property team and the green infrastructure team have worked very closely together in terms of that and have a, a, a proposed way forward in terms of clear up 
consideration of the final lease ar arrangements and indeed um, <clears throat> the process of moving forward costs, etc. So that's all underway and that um, will start um, in the next week in terms of the clearance of the site, etc. Um, we will have a further then definitive um, idea of when we're able to actually open the facility once that's cleared and we uh, finalise the, the lease, etc. Um, so that's ongoing and we'll bring we'll keep members updated in relation to that. In relation to the burial costs, we will bring a report next month on that. But again, certainly that is something I understand that members may consider um, still keeping the finance working group um, going this year. So something that's something that members can consider as part of the finance working group in the run up to the, the rates estimates process for this year. So I hope that's fine. I don't know if there, anyone wants to add anything. No. It's okay. Just to say that the contractors will be in, at a play area Monday morning to wash and to clean. I would say, as Karen has said, we'll have an indication, a better indication then of what's required beyond that. Thank you. Uh, any other members? Aye. Matters raising. Alderman Hussey, go ahead. Uh, just a continuation on item 72, Kevin Playpark. Uh, I welcome uh, the timeline. Uh, the start of the timeline, I think, would be a better way of describing it uh, that we've received. I mean, we've got to be mindful that this particular play park closed in the, in the region of seven years. Would I be correct in that? In the region of seven years, uh, that the Residents, in particular, the children of Kiln have not had a play area. Uh, so I do welcome that the, there's going to be some movement. We know it's not the ideal location. Uh, that's accepted by all. Uh, but as an interim measure and to provide uh, recreational uh, facilities for young folk in that area, it's very, very welcome. Uh, obviously, when we go in uh, to, I suppose, firstly, the access has to be created. Uh, the site itself has to be cleared. Uh, the eight foot tree, which was referred to on Monday, has to be removed, etc. Uh, there will be an assessment, I assume, of the equipment. Uh, in, in the event of equipment not being usable, is there the potential that equipment which was removed from Castle Park in Castle Derg could be relocated even on an interim basis uh, within Kiln to provide good facility for the young folk there. I, I, have, a, I have a matter after that, Chair, that I, that I want to come back on a different matter. Yeah, um, through you, Chair. Members, all of these issues we have considered as officers, and certainly we will consider all of those options. And certainly once we have a better idea of um, any issues with the current equipment, we can consider what we can possibly do in relation to the, the equipment that we have available in storage. So, Thank you, Chair. And I presume we still uh, seek uh, an ideal, a uh, more ideal uh, location, etc. Uh, moving on then to it's the item before that, the greenways, um, the ecclesiastical route, the walk, walking route. Um, will there be an update at some stage on, on progress in that? Uh, I haven't received anything to date, uh, but you know I would hope that the committee would be made aware uh, of what's going on with regard to that Ardstrad Lock Derg uh, proposal or suggestion. Thank yeah. you, Chair. Um, through you, Chair Members, as, as the committee have been advised a number of times, it's been led by Business and Culture. I have spoken to the Director of Business and Culture a couple of times and hopefully we can get something. I'll remind him again in terms of, of an update. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Karen. Okay, Members, nobody else indicated. So move on then to um, item nine, which is the Event Regeneration Director Service Plan 24-25. It's Karen's taking this for us. Thank you, Chair. Uh, members, the purpose of the, this report is to seek your approval to adopt our service plan for 24-25 um, and members to consider some of the outcomes and achievements during 23-24. Uh, members, the report lays out the services that are provided within the directorate um, and again, the summary of uh, our resources um, and again, the the plan, the plan and indeed the report in front of you outcome, 
show some of our outcomes and some of our achievements that um, were made during 23-24. Um, and also it outlines the improvement objectives, the improvement plan and measures of success that we intend to measure uh, during 24-25. Members, uh, one of the key challenges, as you're aware, during um, 23-24 was to implement the, the £900,000 of revenue service uh, cuts across the directorate. Um, and again, as you are aware, that included significant service changes across many areas in the directorate. Um, but members, as you will be aware from other reports to Governance Committee, um, the uh, those £900,000 of revenue services savings have been implemented in full. Um, and so, members, we have uh, outlined to you some of the achievements uh, over the various services during 23-24 um, in Section uh, 3.2 of your report. Um, and I think you can see from that, members, that, again, we've been very busy um, and, indeed, there have been a number of significant achievements during um, this particular year. Um, Again, members, in terms of uh, the, the financial as aspects of it, members of the directorate has a net uh, revenue budget of um, £31.4 uh, million. Pounds, um, and indeed, that's in relation about 40% of the overall council budget is within our directorate. Um, and again, the directorate has um, 437 officers, which again is about 40% of the overall council staff. Um, and again, uh, members, we, we did reduce the budget during 23-24, um, um, and they, those um, budget cuts have all been implemented. So, members, really what we're asking today um, is that you adopt our service plan, which is attached to the report. Um, I'm happy to take any questions that any members have in relation to the report or any comments that members have. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Karen. And uh, just as Chair of this committee, I would like to to thank yourself and indeed all the officers throughout, um, throughout your department for um, your work over the previous year. Um, I have Councillor Barney Hart. Get it. Thank you, Chair, for giving me time to speak. Um, thanks to officers for the very detailed report. Um, Sinn, Féin, Sinn Féin welcomed the report and we can see there is a, a wide range of positive work that has been carried out over the last year. The delivery plan for 2024-25 is quite ambitious and hopefully will be fulfilled. Um, one question I have is on page 80 of our notes and page 35 of the embedded document under the Improvement Delivery Plan. I see there's mention of Straban Greenway North and I want to thank all the ongoing work the Council officers have been doing over the last few months to get the Greenway completed. There are some outstanding issues regarding waste bins and dog filling bins, which I understand are being installed shortly. So that's great and thanks very much. Um, myself and my Sinn Féin colleague, Councillor Bob Boggs, have been pushing to have Straban Greenway North extended. And again, I want to acknowledge the work that Council officers um, are currently doing in this regard. However, I don't see any mention of the Straban Design Greenway in the 2024-25 plan. Um, we do have a steering group in place for this Greenway, so I'm not sure why it has been abandoned. Um, can you give any advice on that? Thank you. Yeah, um, through you, Chair, certainly we will um, consider, continue to consider um, how we might extend the Strabann North Greenway. Again, um, you are aware of the previous issues in relation to um, engagement with landowners, etc. Um, in terms of um, the same mills, certainly that is ongoing. And as you're aware, we are in the process of undertaking the feasibility study. I think really what it, tends to happen in the service plans is we capture as many of the highlights as we can but if we were to put on everything that we're going to be doing it, it would be probably twice as long so apologies for that but certainly just to reassure you that that work is absolutely ongoing the steering group is in place um, and we um, intend to um, complete the feasibility Colin I presume we can bring an update report to members in, in due course in terms of that as well yeah, so I just again, I want to thank you for all the work that you've been doing because it's one of the areas that we want to focus on and the Greenways, so it's very important to us. So thanks again. Thank you, Councillor Hart. Next on the kid, I have Alderman Kerrigan. Thank you very much, Chair, for allowing me in. And uh, again, there's a lot of detail in, in the report. 
and again in, in the risk register as well. And apologies here if I did miss this here, but uh, again, there's a lot of success stories in that. Um, you know, touching even and, and a lot of work that has been done, particularly as suppose you're going parochial and your own DEAs and that, and, and the work that Tony and that has been doing there in regards to the work in Newton Stewart and trying to get more things done there. And again, we have the success there and the work continues, you know yourself, Jerry, in regards to the Leveling Up project in Castle Derg. So we can't uh, lament too much, but we can still lament a bit. Uh, you know, there's still, uh, and again, success stories, the Acorn Farm, uh, the COVID re uh, recovery, the, that 1.2 million in regards to across the eight settlements, that's went down very well. Uh, uh, you, you know, to be fair, it has. Um, and again, the work of the and, and the LDP and those sitting in the planning committee. Uh, there's a couple of wee things there. There's one th thing I was touching on, and maybe I have missed it. I don't see any mention in there in regards to uh, recycling in Castle Derg on that at all. Anywhere, even risk register or anything mentioned in regards to, I'm not just going to call it kiln recycling, but I don't see it raised at all in that, in that, in that section. Um, and uh, another wee question, I suppose, touching on, there is a section in there, improvement objectives, and it states develop 14 to 15 concept uh, in-house plans for new play provision. Uh, and again, I think it's one in particular uh, that, that, that sits with, with the Derg councillors, but also the sparing councillors there, in regards to, I think, uh, in Castle Derg and Newton Stewart, we really need to have if not neighbourhood, a district play area, you know, and I know there's improvements there to the castle site there, but again, even when you go through the provision, they're still designated as local play areas. When I look through even Stabane Town, I think there's one in Stabane Town, which is a neighbourhood play area, is it Patrician, uh, Patrician Villas, I might be, uh, and there's, there's a, um, is it Cumber House, which is now part of the, 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 um, the Spern, which, which wouldn't have been part of the old Glenelly end, but uh, which is classified as a district level, but there's a vast majority of local play areas and, and the old Stabane district council area, and there's a, there's a real lack of the neighbourhood or district areas, and it's, it's one there, I think that Vaughan's home is a prime example of somewhere that could have a neighbourhood or a district-wide play area, and again, the castle site, and again, a follow-on from that, and it's not in our directorate here, but it's tying in with health and communities, some sort of public toilet provision along with that and if we could link in with that even if it's just a disabled toilet or something because if you're having to try and promote and have these larger play facilities and promote the area and Vaughan Home is a real opportunity down in there if you have someone coming with children there where they to go because we have no provision there and Newton Stewart and I know that's an ongoing issue but it's just it's it's linking that and and again that's cross-departmental but touching on to that so uh touching on that then to do with the play provision Touching on the, the the lack of anything regarding recycling in Castle Derg, and just a further wee question, uh, you know, I, I don't fully take on board. It's it's not just ENR; it's planning as well, and the biggest element of of the budget of council, um, and and again, stating there four hundred and thirty seven staff. Are, are we all right in your opinion there in regards to staff turnover? Uh, I know there are certain wee members of staff you go looking for and they have taken a package and are no longer with council or different bits and pieces. Are you content enough that we've got the right staff and are we content enough that we have enough there or just, just a question in general in that regard because there are certain ones are, are go and are they being replaced or are they being replaced to someone of the same equivalent level or or do we step ones up from other positions in council? So it's just touching on that. Are you content with the staffing that you have, or or do you feel that you do need a wee bit more support? So just a couple of those questions. Thank you very much, Chair. Yeah, I'm happy to take on board all of the co the comments that have been made, and and certainly um we can update the the risk register in terms of the um the recycling um provision. That's absolutely fine. And again, note the comments in terms of play and as we move forward. Um, certainly, in and we can engage with with health and communities in relation to public toilet provision. Again, it's always one that's that's quite challenging. Um, and given the, the the resources, in terms of of staff, certainly you know we do have a turnover of staff from time to time. Um, people have have either opportunities. Um, we you, members are aware that there's a voluntary severance scheme in in place from time to time in order to to realise efficiencies. Um, we we always take the opportunity whenever um, we have a change of of circumstances to look at the structure within a, a department to see you know can we do things differently 
do we need exactly that post? Do Can we change things slightly? Do we still need those skills or do we need other skills? So all of that happens in the background. I don't have any major concerns. Um, you know, within the directed members are aware that we have our planning service and indeed that um, we had the, the recent um, planning review and one of the, the recommendations of the planning review is to consider resources within the department, which certainly we will um, follow up on as part of the uh, the implementation of that review. Um, so certainly members, if if you want to give me more staff, I'm, I'll always take more staff. We can always do more with more staff, but we do the best we can. And I think we we, we manage the, the resources that we have as efficiently as we possibly can. And certainly, as you can see from the, the achievements that we've had during the year, we certainly um, get an awful lot done within the directorate. So thank you. Okay, and Alderman Hussey. Uh, thank you, Chair. Like others, can I also express uh, sincere congratulations to to what our e and our team do on the ground and plan to do on the ground. Uh, I just wish we could give you more staff and get more done. Uh, so with all that congratulations, there, there's just one small issue in there and it lies within regeneration. Uh, there were probably a lot more, but this particular one uh, came to my attention yesterday. The conservation-led War Memorial Maintenance Restore Restoration Project uh, I, I had been asked to provide contacts uh, with regard to the, I think it's four, four sites, which, which I've done. I had a call yesterday from uh, a contact that I provided for Sivan. Uh, they, they are concerned that this is the, I think it's the centenary year for the Sivan Local Royal British Legion. And if there is work being done on the War Memorial, they would like to coordinate uh, with council on that, so I've given the contact number, so could contact be made with that particular person? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, and through you, Chair, I'm more than happy to do that, members, and and we can um, work around the their um, schedule and indeed um, either do the works before or after, depending on um, the funding requirements. I know that project's moving forward, but um, we we've yet to got full letter letters of offer, etc., and, and timelines. But we will work with them absolutely. Okay, Councillor Riley. Yeah, thanks, Chair, and thanks, Karen, for the report. And thanks also to the other 436 staff that are listed there uh, in terms of the work that that, that that is done. You can see from the report uh, there's not a DEA that doesn't have a sizable footprint uh, by the department. And if you look at the, the, the pay chart um, as well and the breakdown of the finance across the, the directorate, uh, there's a huge number of uh, items that has been dealt with by the department and the things that, that matter to people on a day-to-day -day basis. So if it's about getting their bin collected, if it's about cemeteries, if it's about uh, street being cleaned, all of those uh, queries uh, come to councillors and in turn come to yourselves. Uh, so just on behalf of the SLP to thank you and the staff for the work that you do uh, in dealing with all of those issues uh, when they arise. Um, it strikes me that the report also touches on the finance uh, you know, uh, page 70 of the pack, page 6 of the actual report itself talks around, you know, the net budget of 31 million, and that's about 40% of the council's overall expenditure. Uh, so it, it, I suppose that speaks to the importance of this directorate uh, to the to the entire council. Um, what the report doesn't do, I suppose, is highlight the fact that, like, for example, uh, we just had DFC uh, representatives in uh, in the regeneration piece. This there on page seventy five of the packet talks about the the money that was spent in terms of Spencer Road and Carlisle Road revitalisation shop fund and enhancement program that I know that Tony Monaghan was was heavily involved in, and how that was one point two million of DFC funded projects. So as well as the rate payers money that is being put into the department, uh, the department is attracting in other monies from other public bodies, and I think it would be useful to see, um, you know, that that reflected it to a greater degree in the in the report uh, to show that uh, that this is a, a mechanism of uh, acting as a magnet to get other public funds into our council area, um, you know, and I think that the 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 work that's as I said at the start uh, that's being done is valued by people. Um, you know, we're right across the council area. So thanks to Karen and the team. Thanks, Chair. Through you, Chair. Members, certainly that is a very important um point to to consider. You know, certainly I suppose the team um will 
part of their core work really is to um, work on on projects and to bring in uh, funding from elsewhere to maximise the, the investment made by Council. And I know um, in many of our reports that we'll put forward, we'll try and reflect that. And I know um, Colin will always say that it, it's m m at least a, a, a four to one um, ratio of the amount of funding we bring in for, for the, the Council expenditure. So certainly I can take that back to the team and maybe we'll try and see how we might be able to bring that back to members in our report to reflect you know, over the year, uh, what council spend and how we've actually maximised that. Really, I suppose that's across the director, but it's also in, in other areas as well. So it may come back and through governance committee potentially instead of just ENR, although we do do quite a, a number of them, I have to say. So thank you. I can certainly, re we'll, we'll all reflect back to the teams, uh, the, the comments of members, and certainly we're very appreciative of the support that we get from members in terms of the work we do. Thanks. Thank you, Chair, for letting me in. And obviously, I appreciate you giving me time today because I'm not a member of this committee. Uh, but this is a, a very important uh, discussion. And I do want to commend the uh, officers and, and all the staff that are part of the uh, Environment and Regeneration uh, Directorate. Uh, there is a huge body of work here that has been completed, and there are very, very ambitious plans. Um, and I know we've got very, very high expectations and demands on the council to see them completed. Um, and that, uh, you know, we've done some really excellent uh, work and we have uh, excellent uh, plans in place. So uh, saying that, I do want to pull out a few things uh, to be, not to be very local or too territorial, but look, I just want to, you know, it's fantastic that Brook Park get the Green Flag Award and get the Green Flag Heritage Award. I think that the completion and the reopening of the city baths is just brilliant. And I think you've probably heard that celebrated uh, right across the, uh, you know, the district. Um, and those are very, very good things. And these are things that really matter to people and matter to people's lives and, and make them better and make them and, and improve people's lives. Um, I suppose I have a couple of questions and there could be a thousand questions out of this, but that, uh, you know, that there's a 50 per average 50 percent household recycling rate so i don't know if we could get some comment on that uh, you know because 50 percent um is in the middle and and we would like to see that improved so if if we can't go into detail now that may warrant a bit of a discussion about what we can do to, to drive that up uh and then the second one is um uh you know we're we're, we're trying to also implement our, our our uh climate action plan and I just read there about the installation of the smart energy monitors in the, in the guild hall and uh, the, re, the realizing potential of an annual, annual energy saving of almost 40% in the guild hall, um, which is, to my mind, fantastic, right? And we, we chatted a bit about this, and maybe if there's an opportunity to comment a bit more about that, if anybody wants to speak to it. But if every single building in the council estate saved 40%, uh, on their energy costs. That's a great reduction of emissions. It's also a big saving to the council. And if then all our organizations learn from that, if we're able to lead and, uh, you know, businesses learn from that uh, and anybody that, that would be following the kind of model of the council, that would be that would have a huge impact across our district. So I want to say I think that this is a step forward as well. And if anybody wants to give further comment on that, I would very much welcome it. Um, well, I'll maybe start off and then maybe Connor can come, come in, in in terms of, of recycling, which certainly, you know, I think to reach 50 percent, I think Connor can tell us when we were below 10, which wasn't really actually that long ago, believe it or not. Um, but the, some of the the, um, the the issues that we're working on to try and continually drive that up, we would love to see that improve um, and work with with our householders to, to drive that up. In terms of um, the climate action plan and indeed energy, yes, absolutely. That was that was a really excellent initiative that we introduced into the the Gilto. One of the things what we've been working on as officers over the last number of uh, months is, in effect, to, to ensure that we have an invest to save model um, in relation to energy management of our own assets. Um, and there have members will be aware um, through governance committee and as part of the rates that we actually set aside quite a significant amount of money to further um, implement energy saving um, 
measures in in some of our other big hitting models. So, um, for example, uh, for Lorena Leisure Centre, etc. You know, we we obviously have to. You know, in order to do it all, it is invest to save. So you have to invest in the first instance. So really, we have to have a a prioritised list. So the the energy manager had worked through, um, basically looking at a number of of our big, um, energy using assets, how we could install um measures to reduce that. Then what a very important aspect of that is the payback period so it really sort of you look like how long will it take us to um, pay back the money that it costs to actually implement the measures and so what we've done is we've tried to concentrate on the ones where it's the lowest payback in the first instance um and then you know obviously after that payback period you're if you like you're in the black in terms of the money so how do we then move towards and uh, reinvesting that money back and the other assets to again work on it. Um, there's some some of the measures are, are pretty easy, you know, LED lights, etc. are pretty easy. Some of them are much more complex and, and detailed in terms of, you know, the, the heating systems or heat pumps and all of those types of issues. Smart um again, uh smart usage of energy, which is is where we were um using the Gilto project in terms of I think it probably would be useful if we um, brought maybe a potentially a, a presentation to committee in terms of, of some of this um, because you're right Councillor Harkin in terms of uh, it has always been our intention to be a leader in this and try and actually demonstrate to other organisations both in the public sector and in the private sector and, and indeed householders that um, this can be done and it, it's yes there may be um, you know, uh, some cost up front, but it, there is a saving. But also, again, indeed, uh, engaging with, with central government to try and work with them around what financial incentives are available to householders, what um, incentives are available to housing associations and indeed to businesses um, and the public sector, um, ideally, in terms of implementing the measures. So we've had a number of discussions with Department for Economy in relation to that, um, who lead on energy from a central government perspective, um, and indeed will continue to have those. And, and I am aware that there have been some investments made in central government estates through um, grant funding. Um, and again, um, I suppose members will agree that that should be available to to councils and in, in the public sector as well. So we'll continue those conversations and perhaps we'll bring a further um, presentation back. I don't know, Connor, if you want to further comment on the recycling rate. Um, yeah, just a couple of comments. And as you said, back in 2002, this council had a recycling rate of about 2%. So we're sitting up at 50. So we have made significant progress and no doubt more to be done. And there are a number of reports uh, and for members consideration today, item 11 on producer responsibility EPR and the potential within that to again increase uh, recycling rates and um, report 13 on the uh, rethinking resources, which is the uh, revised strategy um, issued by a department that contains a number of proposals in terms of amending um, curbside collections and to uh, further sort. So um, those those uh, are works in progress and underpinning all of those are higher recycling rates for uh, municipal waste of between 65 and 70 percent, depending on there was one with climate bill of 70 percent. Um, and uh, one with the data uh, brought forward in terms of 65 percent. So there's um, certainly work to be done to get to those, and those are fixed targets. Um, with regard to energy, as Karen has said, there are a number of schemes ongoing within Council. So we will, we are looking at um, retrofitting LEDs and swapping out a lot of lighting in our building, which are easy to do. Um, the bigger projects are retrofitting in terms of uh, making our buildings more energy efficient in terms of heat loss and so on. So. Those are larger scale projects that will require significant investment um, and it's where that funding comes from to do that. Within that, we're working with our colleagues on, in Donegal on four decarbonisation zones. Uh, within the district, we have uh, a number of audit um, uh, energy audits completed on public buildings within those areas. And again, we know what's required um, in terms of what needs to be done. The issue is, can we get funding to do that? Um, and it's millions of pounds at this stage to do that. So as an organisation, we're committed to um, not just driving down our energy costs, but obviously uh, reducing our CO2 emissions and all of that forms part of the same programme. And there will be, again, a series of reports coming forward in terms of the works that we're intending to take uh, forward as part of that. And with regard to waste, there will be a series of um, initiatives um, and part of the work that I want to do with, with members over the next couple of months is to have workshops 
in terms of looking at these consultations and what the council's view is on um, feeding into those consultations and the direction of travel that we need to go uh, uh, and as an organization. Again, um, there are opportunities to uh, within EPR to attract funding and to draw down funding, not just capital funding, but revenue funding more significantly, but it's what that might look like in terms of service delivery. And that's something that members will, will be key to advising and informing on. Okay, members, I think I have a need a proposal and second, seconder to adopt the recommendations. So, Councillor McGinley, Councillor Hossley. Okay, members, so we'll go on then to item 10, which is the Clooney Master Plan planning studies, and Karen's taking that for us. Yeah, members, this, the purpose of the report is to um, progress studies required as part of the Clooney Master Plan in order to take this particular project through, through planning. Um, and members, as you're aware that uh, we you approved the draft design and consultation feedback uh, in January, um, and we undertook that uh, consultation, um, and there is sufficient evidence to support the broad elements of the project moving forward, um, which the next stage be in submitting planning applications. Um, and members, as uh, with all these projects, that is also balanced with some concerns um, that have been raised during the consultation process. Um, these uh, in this particular project relate to uh, linkages, the greenway linkages along Clooney Park West <clears throat> from a health and safety perspective, traffic noise and disruption to residents arising from the, the planned community sports development um, have also been raised. So members, we do need to uh, undertake a number of additional um, studies and external expertise in order to submit the planning applications um, over the next couple of months. Um, we members are aware that uh, the Capital Review Group had previously set aside £32,450 for this project, um, which has um, been used for uh, appointing or design consultants, etc. Um, and we do need the additional 30000 to um, prepare additional studies. Um, Members, the, the normal processes is through capital um, capital projects, uh, working group and governance committee. However, um, if there is an urgency, um, it has been agreed that, that um, requests can come to a parent um, de department and committee. And so therefore, uh, we, are, we have engaged with our, our uh, colleagues in finance and we are uh, proposing that 30,000 comes from our 23-24 uh, uh, parks development budget savings. Um, so members, we're asking you to approve the allocation of the funding towards the studies that are required um, in order to submit this project for planning. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Karen. Uh, Councillor Dini. Uh, thank you, Karen, for the report. I'm happy to propose it. Um, studies are essential to progress the planning application for for the Clooney Master Plan, um, which we, of course, want to see progress as quickly as possible. So, Garmi, I'll go. Thank you, Councillor Dini and Councillor Riley. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Karen, for the report as well. Uh, happy to second the proposal uh, and to thank Karen and the officers for the work done to get us to this stage uh, and also the work done recently in terms of re-interrogating the stakeholder list to make sure that we're talking to the right people and everybody has a chance to have their say. So. Uh, happy to second the chair. Thanks. Okay, members, that's been proposed and seconded. So, item 11, and Connor's taking that for us. Um, thanks, Chair. Just related to the previous discussion on recycling rates, um, the report um, is to advise and update members on discussions at a national level, level with regard to um, EPR, which is extended producer responsibility, and to seek members' approval to recruit a shared waste specialist to deal with the implications of EPR uh, representing district councils uh, and ILGA um, at a national forum. Um, the background to this is that producer responsibility is a concept widely uh, used within the waste sector, uh, aimed at ensuring that businesses that manufacture, import and sell products onto the open market are responsible for their end of life uh, environmental impact. Um, there have been a series of discussion documents um, issued on this previously, uh, with the latest one running from uh, into October 2023. And the purpose of the consultation was to clarify and test the obligations created in the regulations and uh, to test their operability. Following the consultation, uh, further discussions took place with all the stakeholder organisations, following which it was agreed to pause the process to allow for further and detailed engagement across all four UK regions. 
Uh, this uh, engagement has developed into a practical implementation with local government being brought together with the packaging sector as part of the whole collection and packaging value chain in the steering group to design a scheme administrator which will be responsible for delivery of the uh, PEPR scheme from 2025. Uh, the scheme will move the cost of dealing with packaging waste away from the taxpayer and local councils onto the packaging producers who will pay for the full cost of managing packaging waste uh, and again that will be removed from householders. Through the fees they pay to councils, producers will be incentivized to use less packaging, uh, to use less packaging that can be recycled and to meet higher recycling um, um, targets. Um, again, in the key issues, again, it sets out the basis to the EPR scheme. Um, and uh, following discussion, it was agreed that a national steering group be established with representatives from local government across the UK invited to participate so as to ensure that the views of local government uh, are central and considered as part of this process. Uh, in consideration of the above, it was discussed at Solus and the Council Waste Forum in Nilga and agreed that a dedicated resource be appointed to represent all of uh, Northern Ireland's Dutch councils on the steering group and the related preparatory national uh, meetings of local government. Uh, again, following discussions with SIB, they have agreed to recruit and manage this resource with the postal holder working 2.5 days per week on EPR. Uh, and related matters for the district councils. Again, there was a draft JD and uh, specification included um, in the pack for members' consideration. The ask of members today is to allocate £5,000 um, per annum over the next two years um, to contribute to the, the salary costs um, of this person. Uh, that person will be bringing back reports, which again will come into members for consideration. And as I said, the impact of these regulations for council will result in a net gain as producers make payments for the cost of managing household waste. This is thought to provide an estimate of 1.2 billion of funding to local authorities across the UK each year for managing packaging waste, easing pressures on council's current type projects. Uh, so members are asked to approve the funding to support this resource as laid out in the report. Propose the recommendation, Chair. Okay, and Councillor Riley indicated. Yeah, happy to second it, Chair. Uh, but also just to add, I, I know that um, I think this is very welcome and I uh, welcome the conversations with other local councils uh, to make sure that we get uh, the best value out of all of this. Um, I'm conscious that other producers of packaging waste have now thankfully started offering bring the past back to them so that they can take it uh, back from the customer. Um, but I'm also aware that some of the big supermarkets like the likes of Tesco, Sainsbury's that offer that don't always advertise it in the in the, in the same way uh, that they should do. Uh, and, and it seems to vary from store to store in terms of how well uh, the, the, the market uh, it to the customers. Um, is there anything Connor can add on, the, on that point about the supermarkets and what they can do to alert their customers to the fact that this recycling of plastic opportunity is available in the stores. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, Chair, as mentioned in the report, there will be DRS deposit return schemes, and that will form, again, um, part of the plan to eliminate certainly plastic waste. Um, and uh, there's a scheme operating in the Republic of Ireland at the moment. And for people, you know, if you buy a, a beverage, plastic beverage or a, a tin beverage container in the south, you can return that and secure a deposit or get your uh, deposit returned on it. So that will form part of the scheme. I think this is aimed at capturing as much and diverting as much as that packaging waste, whether it's plastic, um, cardboard, um, tin or so on, from residual bins. And I think the large supermarkets will have a significant role to play in that as producers. Now, whether or not they're content to uh, offer like in-store um, collection facilities, as part of the discussion that's so ongoing at the moment. And I think it's critical there for that, you know, that's why we need to be in as a district council and as a group of district councils within Northern Ireland, we need to be at the centre of that to make sure you know, our council and the ratepayers of this uh, district are being properly represented and um, that, you know, that, that the large producers accept their responsibility and putting in place proper schemes to deal with those ways. So it will form part of it, but at this stage, it's a discussion. Okay, thanks for that. That's been proposed and seconded. No other councillor indicated. So, members, uh, items 12 to 17 are for information. But I'll go through them uh, one at a time. So, if you just want to indicate, anybody has a question or comment. Item 12 is our building control applications. Item 13 is rethinking our resources. Martin, yeah, go ahead. thanks, Chair. Just really follow, uh, follows on from Connor's contribution to the earlier item when we're talking about the the, the director's service plan. Um, in terms of the service plan and and this item, uh, we think uh, we think in our resources. Uh, is council involved in rethinking 
what we can do with technology in terms of the new additions of like AI and and route optimization for uh, for our collection of our waste. Uh, other opportunities that AI present that can be harnessed for uh, the public good in terms of reducing expenses. Thanks. Um, Chair, the short answer is yes, and again, a lot of this will form part of this uh, consultation at the moment. We use AI in some of our. We've we've a, a bot um, that's up there that provides you know detailed information on our waste services. So that's one example of of where we've used that. Um, so you know the use of technology is something that will develop going forward. Um, probably you know the usual caveats around all of that that we just need to be mindful of, but certainly in terms of. Uh, improving uh, using technology to improve our collection systems and to improve how we interact with our, our citizens is something that we are very keen to do. Okay, members. Uh, item fourteen is the proposed disabled parking base. Mr. Hussey, uh, Chair, uh, just a quick query on this one. We we do get reports when uh, a disabled parking bay is granted. Uh, I wonder would it be possible from the department to know. How many are refused? What percentage of applications are actually refused? Thank you. Yeah, through you, Chair. Um, well, happy to ask the question. I know that they do refuse them. I've got a family member who has them, so it, it does happen. But they have criteria, certain criteria. But we can certainly ask them the question. No problem. Chair, just quickly, quickly, on really, that, yeah. quickly on that item. I, last month I'd asked as well about the budget that DFI had for repainting existing bays. Um, I, I don't see it. Just follow up so Karen can pick that up with them. Thanks. Okay. Uh, item 15 is the flooding update. 16 is mobile update, which we've had a presentation on earlier. Um, item 17 is the request to use tenor courts at St. Collins Park. Councillor McGinley. Carmega Chair, and I've actually sent a wee proposal through to the committee section in relation to this report. Um, obviously, we want to see progress and events happening, um, but there are some issues, as far as I'm aware, um, in relation to this particular event and the engagement with tenants within St. Collins Park, particularly St. Collins Park House. Um, 3.1 in the report says that these have been addressed by the promoter and mitigated measures have been suggested by them. I don't think St. Collins Park House would agree on that. Um, I know that they've got events that are planned for the same weekend and have very serious concerns on and around the vulnerabilities or the young people that, that may be staying with them at that weekend. And I don't think those concerns have been addressed at this stage. The proposal that I've put forward is asking that this event doesn't go ahead until those concerns have been addressed. Um, we obviously don't have an issue with there being an event. We want to be promoting events, but it needs to be done in agreement with people who may be affected. I think the proximity in Collins Park House to the tennis pitches, is, is, is their concerns are warranted, um, specifically in the young people. So the proposal is on the screen there. And I would ask that that's considered before this event's given the go ahead. Okay, Councillor McGinley, members, the proposal's on the screen. Um, have you a second, Councillor Dini? Any other member wish to speak? Sorry, Alderman Middleton, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just have some concerns about this on the basis that I do think the groups need to be consulted. I think it's really, really important that we consult with any group within the area. Um, but we've seen what's happened in Everton Square when one group is allowed to veto or one one organisation. And I just want clarity as this especially with the only being in bold is this like a veto situation because it, it reads to me like it is and i just i'm very pro events i'm sure we all are so i just i just want to make sure on that thank you through you chair if i can respond to that this is absolutely not a veto that's not what we're looking for but given the work that st collins park house do um particularly with young people if they have concerns we need to make sure that those concerns and the safety and safeguarding and everything else that comes with that are addressed by the event promoter before we're allowing licensed events to be so close to uh, a premises that specifically um, caters a lot of the time to, to young people that are underage. So I'm not saying that it shouldn't go ahead, absolutely not, but I think that there needs to be agreement. And on that, it says the agreement of stakeholders and tenants. It's not just in Collins Park House, but they are one of the the, the lead ones within the, the proximity of that site that have raised concerns. So that's, that's why I've highlighted them. 
but any other stakeholders should be um, consulted with as well. Um, but as I say, those concerns to me are legitimate and, and should be addressed, um, but in a way that allows the event to go ahead. We're not suggesting to be. Okay, I'm going to bring Karen on just. Um, through you, Chair, uh, members, I've spoken um, this afternoon to the Director of Business and Culture in relation to this, and you know that members, the, the officers from Business and Culture, have been liaison with the events promoter, um, and indeed all their officers across councils, such as our Parks Development Team, who manage the wider park, etc. Um, in relation to this, um, they're more than happy to do additional um, engagement consultation in relation to this. You understand this report was in here for information today. It can be discussed further at full council next week um, and the director of business and culture has undertaken to ensure that we do further consultation with the stakeholders ahead of that so if members want to discuss it further at full council then that certainly can happen um, <clears throat> i know the event is, is planned for the the end of may so there also is a further business and culture committee follow-up before that as well so members if, if you're happy with that we can um, certainly uh, take that forward and it can be discussed further Council. Thank you. Okay, members. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a proposer and seconder for that. Um, members, are, are we happy enough to, to go with the proposal or do you just want me to ask Karen to take a vote? Um, thank you, Councillor McGinley, for your clarification. And I, I'm just still not 100% content, and I feel like we probably need to discuss a wee bit further and even maybe some thinking time. So, um, on that basis, I would be inclined to abstain. Okay, is that? I'll just thank me. I'll just ask you, and put it, we'll take, take it to the vote. Go ahead, Alderman. Thank you. <laughs> Obviously, if you if you look at the documentation, the sort of stuff is six weeks in advance. I think is the is the time period. We're within that time frame now. What are the legal implications of this? Do we know? Through you, chair, I don't have that information here today. So we would have to discuss it next week at full council, I suppose, in terms of um, I know Philip will be there, and also our director of business and culture. So certainly we can discuss it further then. Okay, members, as Karen says, we can take the, the vote now and all council offers, offer, offers members further opportunity to, to raise any issues they have around it or ask any questions. So we'll ask Karen just to take a vote now. Um, and members, we're for just for clarity, we're um, voting on the proposal that's on your screen. So, Alderman Hussey. On the basis of my question, I abstain at this moment in time. Okay, Alderman Kerrigan. I'll abstain. Okay. Uh, Alderman Middleton? Abstain. Councillor Barr? Or. Councillor Raymond Barr? Councillor Deeney? Ta. Councillor Duffy? Ta. I just stopped out there, but I'm well over it, so I've read it. Councillor Hart? Ta. Okay. Councillor McGinley? Ta. Councillor McHugh? Councillor Murphy? Ta. Councillor Norris? Or. And Councillor Riley? So that passes, Chair. Okay, members, uh, that takes us to the end of our um, open business. Um, I'm just conscious it's gone past six o'clock. Do members want a quick break or do you want to keep the, the shoe down? Keep her lit then. Um, need a proposer and seconder to go on the confidential. Proposed, Zach Kerry then, and Alderman Hussey. Um, we'll just wait for the, wait for the nod.